name is Jessica LaRusso from Workplace Education Manitoba and I am your host and support today for the webinar titled Email Etiquette. Before I introduce our instructor today, I'd like to review some features that you'll be using during your webinar and some troubleshooting as well. On the top of your screen, you'll see three icons, a smile emoji, question mark, and a telephone. The emoji will open up a variety of expressions such as thumbs down, uh, thumbs up, smile emoji, applause, and your instructor uh, will ask you from time to time for feedback. As well, there's a question mark in a blue box, which uh, you are able to ask questions that the instructor will answer at the end of the webinar. She will also ask you for private comments, statements, and that's where, you're, where you will answer those particular requests. If you need to switch to the telephone, please do so, and the telephone icon is there for you. Lastly, there is an option for you to chat. As well, the instructor may ask you to use that option for group comments and interaction. I have shared two links, as well as um, my email address, which is jlorusso at wem.mb.ca, and the telephone number for you to text, which is 204-770-4864. In the next link, you'll see a handout for the session. It's a PDF. Take a moment to click on that and download it onto your computer. Next, you'll see a link provided that says Jot Form. At this moment, before we introduce our instructor, I'd like you to click on that particular link named Jot Form and answer eight questions that you'll need to do prior to the webinar. We'll take a minute to do this right now. Please click on the link and answer those eight questions. We'll give you a minute. Thank you. I see some uh, jot forms are coming in. Thank you. As you can see, it only takes a moment to fill it out. Excellent. We've just re received another jot form. And I'll give you a couple more moments. Excellent. Thank you so much. There's a few more to come in and I'm going to move on. But uh, if you have any questions or concerns, please text me or email me in with the information provided. So I'm going to move on to talk about our wonderful instructor. I should say introduce our wonderful instructor. Uh, again, thank you for joining us. And um, our instructor, Rochelle Amy, has had an impressive uh, professional career in education. She's been engaged in education and student development since the year 2000 in such settings such as university, K-12, and adult education. Uh, Rochelle Amy's focus is on non profit sector in administrative and marketing. She has instructed and trained in nonprofit settings, making her a valuable asset to workplace education Manitoba. Also, as we all know, she's an amazing instructor in essential skills. She's been with Workplace Education Manitoba since 2019 and works at the Interlake West Center. Uh, on a personal note, and I'm so proud of her and very thrilled, and I talk about this all the time, she went back to school recently to get her master's degree in leadership, 
So I'm very proud of you, Rochelle. I know that we all are. So please help me welcome Rochelle Amy using the applause emoji. And uh, I'm very excited to learn from you. Rochelle, you have the screen. Thank you. Thank you, Jessica. Thank you so much, everyone, for being together with us today in this virtual togetherness. Uh, it's, it's great to be able to gather. I'm broadcasting to you from the Selkirk area, so I'm in the Interlake region, and it's nice and overcast, and it feels like it's going to rain, and I'm super excited because I just planted some little trees, and they could really use a little bit of help. So I hope wherever you find yourself around Manitoba today, you also enjoy the weather and what it brings and our time together. Because Workplace Education Manitoba is really focused on helping people to develop the essential skills that they need for work, for learning, and for life. We've got a website you can visit, wem.mb.ca. It's got lots of announcements on there about what our different course offerings are. We always like to give our thanks to those who funded the program because as you know, you filled out a registration form to be here with us, but you didn't have to pay any money. And that's because we were able to develop our curriculum with funding from ERSDC and Manitoba Education and Training. And so we're really grateful for that and we don't take it lightly. We're thankful we get to offer this across the province. And that's really our vision, is that we want everyone in Manitoba, no matter where they are, to be able to acquire those essential skills that they need to help them pursue their goals. And those are workplace goals, learning goals, etc. Now that being said, uh, we're from all over the place. So I already gave you the sneak peek that I'm from the Interlake area, and specifically in Selkirk at this moment. And I just wanted to get a sense of what parts of the province you're all joining in from. So if you're comfortable, please go ahead and put that in the chat area over to the left side of your screen. And just type in there for me the town or the city that you're joining in from today, or if it's not even a town or a city, just the region. So we have, oh, cool. You can see some of these different towns, Dauphin, St. Anne, Altona, Lacta. Bonnie, oh, so cool, we're from all over. And I know Jessica's joined us from Winnipeg, and we have someone from Steinbeck. So cool, so, you know, there's so many disadvantages to this pandemic era that we're in right now, and yet one of the advantages is we get to do this. We get to connect with people. I may not have met you from these other towns in other ways, but we get to engage online together, and that's so exciting to be able to do. And no matter what region you're in, in Manitoba, we might have a classroom near you. So we have classrooms that we call West Centers. So that just means workplace education and skills training. And there's different programs that are offered. It's kind of a drop-in style where you can sign up to come for one or two sessions a week, whatever works for you. And you can work on anything from computer skills to numeracy to literacy, oral communication, different workshops and classroom sessions are offered. So I encourage you to check out our website, find one of these West Centers near you. If you've been to one of them, give me an emoji, give me a thumbs up emoji if you have actually already visited one of our West Centers. This might be newer to you, but some of you maybe have done that already. So that's pretty cool to see. So they all look different in the different towns across the province, but content wise, you're gonna be able to connect with instructors who really wanna help you get to that next level of learning to achieve your personal goals. We refer to Workplace Education Manitoba as wanting to zero in on the nine essential skills. What are these nine essential skills? What are those? What does that mean? Well, as you can see the list here, um, it was gathered by a national study done with employers trying to articulate what is it that makes employees successful in the workplace, no matter the industry, no matter the rank or the pay, what is it that makes an employee successful? And this is what the employers gave back to us. They said these nine skills, really nationwide, if a Canadian had these skills, 
they would be able to succeed in their workplace. So today, you've signed up for email etiquette, and that really touches on the writing essential skill. So not just writing with a pen and paper, but writing and be able to communicate a message with the written word. If I had the emoji button on my screen, I would give you the high five right now because that's a hugely in-demand skill. So we find that employers, the majority of employers, actually put that at the top of the list. So if you could imagine, if they had the three top skills that they want, they want leadership skills and ability, and they want you to be able to work as a team member, and they want communication skills specifically in writing. And that's so interesting because it, writing, it's not always formal. A lot of stuff in the workplace that happens is quite informal. Even being able to take a good telephone message and document and funnel down what's the core message that needs to be in this little piece of paper indicating someone needs you to return a call. This touches written communication skills. We can't underestimate it especially when we see in our research that employers put that in the top three skills that you need to have. So what I encourage you to do is take a note of this workshop that you've done, the dates and what the content was, and tuck this away in your portfolio as one of the things that you did. Because not only will it impact your current workplace and help you with the skills that you need for what you're doing right now, but it's also something that you can tuck into that professional portfolio to mark that you did this at this time and at this place. And just like going into a formal school environment, this is not nothing. This is something to be able to show your employer that you have right now or a potential employer. Have this on your resume that this is a course you took. It's something you did. And you'll be answering that in-demand need that the employers have talked about what they want. So we're gonna break this down into two bite-sized sessions. So we can do this together in two sessions. We're gonna meet, of course, today and exactly this time next week. And today we're gonna to talk about the technical stuff. So how we craft something, how this writing process goes and the steps that are involved with it. And we're gonna talk about how to be able to communicate a clear message. And then next session when we gather, we're going to talk about tips and tricks. I might even tell you about one of my pet peeves <laughs> and how to avoid errors. So I have some ideas for you on how to be able to send an email and have the attachment and not have the huge gaff of an email going to someone you didn't want to go to. And we'll also touch on how the email rules kind of adapt a bit in a crisis. So that's how we're going to break out the two sessions distinctive from each other. And today's will feel a little more technical. Next week will feel a little bit more practical like tips and tricks. So that's gonna be fun together. I would love to know if you're comfortable sharing, if you would be able to jot in the chat for me, what industry are you in? And you can share that for maybe not even your current job, maybe you're working on getting into an industry, what's the type of industry that you're in or that you're aiming for? What kind of work do you wanna do? Is it customer service? Is it production, manufacturing? Tell me what type of industry, sales? Uh, is it anything involving numeracy and accounting? Let's see. Awesome. Customer service and education, accounting. Oh, cool. I said some of those as examples that I didn't even know where you were coming from. That's super cool. And uh, production, manufacturing. Um, you won't be able to see all of the comments coming in. Some people have it set to a privacy setting, so I can see a few more than you might be able to see. Um, but that's great. So we have all kinds of people from different industries, and, and yet we all have this in common, right? No matter what industry we're in, we're forced to deal with this tool called email, whether we like it or not. We all have that in common. Take a wild guess for me. How many emails do you think the average business person receives in a day? Shoot me a number. How many do you think the average amount of inbound emails can look like? It's a little bit higher than what you think. 
So, okay, so we have our first guess in at 40, 50, something like that, 60, yes. And of course, this part does change a little bit based on the industry you're in, but Clinton, you're absolutely right. The average number of new inbound emails in a day is often between 100 and 120. And if that's not enough to make you run screaming from the building, I don't know what is. So that volume of email alone tells us we have to figure this thing out because people are relying on email. We're not going to be able to get away from this, right? It's not going anywhere. Outbound emails a day, not much different. It's just under 100. They estimate on average it could be about 90 outbound emails a day. Again, depending on industry and what your particular role in that industry is. But it's astounding. If 90 is average, that means there's some people dealing with way more outbound emails in a day than just 90. So this is where we have to gain confidence, clarity, and essential skills to be able to master the art of sending the emails. This is sometimes what email could feel like. Give me an emoji if you've ever felt like this when you open your email. <laughs> Sometimes I open my email and the inbox is so full that I'm like this guy in this picture. Where it's just like, oh man, where do I even start? And there are so many challenges related to it because it may not just be the volume, it also might be the level of urgency in all these emails or depending who sent them to you. You'd get a different feeling when an external client or customer's email in you, that puts you on a little bit of a different alert than if your favorite colleagues email in you, where that puts you in a different place of comfort. So the reality is we do experience a wide range of challenges and have all kinds of different voices that we use depending who it is we're emailing. Well, that voice of what we're communicating, what does that voice look like? What, what does that voice mean? How does communication usually happen? Well, in a normal scenario where we're not just behind a computer sending an email, but just normal face-to-face, in-person communication, what would we guess is the amount of your actual voice? What would we guess is the amount of communication that happens through the visual and through the nonverbal communication? And what is the percentage of communication that happens through the actual words themselves? So the choice of words versus the tone and the body language. What would that look like? It's surprising. Words is the least amount on the whole quiz. <laughs> so we measure the actual choice of words in the smallest way. And we measure tone, pauses, intonation, speed, and how fast we're talking about something or real dramatic pauses to be able to emphasize a point, that takes up a good chunk of how much communication. And then the whole idea of body movements, face, arms, and so on, that takes up another. And a, a funny story about that, recently I was teaching one of these webinars, and as you can see, I sometimes talk with my hands. <laughs> and someone was watching me talk to my computer, but they were outside, they were looking through a window watching. So they couldn't see, they couldn't hear what I was talking about. But they were watching these hands go and this face gesture go. And so they got back to me saying they thought I was doing sign language for the hearing impaired. And it was so hilarious because I thought I didn't even know I used my hands that much. But I realized, man, someone forms a huge assumption on what you're saying about most things that don't involve the actual words, but just everything else that you're using. And yet, when we use email, we only are dealing with the 7%. That's all we've got. We've got the 7% of the communication with just using our words. So getting that right is so critical because there's a huge piece of the pie, the majority of the pie is missing because people don't get the opportunity to hear the other components and see the other expressions of communication that don't happen just through the words. So if we recognize that writing is really a tool and it's an important tool, and the whole point is so that we have a shared understanding, we have a clear understanding of what it is that was communicated, and with any tool, you might know how to use, let's say, a saw 
and maybe you know how to do certain things with the saw, but maybe there's other things. Maybe you could do mitered edges instead of straight edges. So with any tool you have, there's always a way to expand how you can use it and use it in different settings for different applications. Now, I love this slide because this is so how we default in our minds, right? We tend to think there's the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. But actually, that's not really what it is. In email, it's a little bit different. It's what you meant to say, what you actually said, and then how they interpreted what you said. It's three totally different realities than the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So what you actually said in how they interpreted it versus what you intend to say takes way more thought in email and you have way less opportunity to explain yourself. So getting that right in the writing process is huge. Now, one thing about email, I guess I'll tell you one of my pet peeves, <laughs> is that often people think email is about them. They think it's self-serving. I need something. I need an answer. Or I need to spew this out. And really, that's not how communication works. You don't walk around just blabbing out one-way things that you don't want anyone to interact with verbally. So why would you do that non-verbally in writing? So recognizing that it's not enough for you to just plop some communication into an email and hit send so that it becomes someone else's problem. That's an irresponsible use of email. A responsible view of email is how am I writing, what am I writing, and what purpose does it serve? Now we can get lost thinking that email is all about step number two. That's actually what is our default, is we think it's about step number two. <laughs> Actually, step number two is the easiest part and sometimes the shortest part of it. And so we go right into our email program and we just start writing. And if you're a great writer, you might do steps one and two combined. If it's a simple task, one and two combine really well. But it's a, if it's a complicated project or a fiery situation, or something with many components to it and many people involved in the discussion, you actually should spend more time in step one than the other two steps. And sometimes, I, you know, one hot tip for you is a lot of people, step one works better if you do it by pen. So using an actual pen and paper instead of the keyboard slows down your brain enough that as you're writing, you can think faster than you can write with your hand. So as you're writing and planning out and organizing and trying to get your point into bullet points, if you do that by hand, you're more likely to be able to funnel down your message to the core message and not use a bunch of extra language that would muddy it up. And if you would do step one by hand on just a little note paper, hopefully you keep a notepad on your desk, like just those legal pads where you can tear off papers. If you keep one of those on hand when you're going to write a critical email or even non-critical, just something that impacts your image, um, if you could plan and organize your points and put that in handwriting or printing, that's going to set the stage for a successful step number two, where you actually write the email itself, type it out into your email program, and then we never hit send without doing step three. And step three can be quite involved, and, and we'll get into that about what the different tools are and what the different types of engagement for others are, because sometimes your email is a lot stronger and better if it's not just from you, but maybe from some other people who are also inputting. Now in your workplace, isn't there like a whole list of safety things? And then there's a whole list of things that are not written down. And it's like the unwritten rules. Like, you know, one unwritten rule would be to refill the coffee if you're the one to take the last cup out of it. Nobody's telling you to do that, but it's sort of an unwritten rule in the staff room that this is what you do. Well, when it comes to email, there's tons of unwritten rules. They're not going to be in your employee handbook. You have to figure out what they are, and you have to do a little bit of investigating to know what they are in your particular company. Now, in this, in this uh, slide here, we, we do talk about some common ones. 
So irrelevant email is huge. Um, if that person does not have a need for the email, don't send it to them. <laughs> they will not be blessed by having another thing in their inbox. Reply all, please, please, please pay attention to this. If someone sends you an email and you hit the reply button, please note that some email settings, you can set this so that you'll automatically reply to all when you hit reply. That would be the first choice, the default setting. Or you can change your default setting so that it never defaults to reply all and you'd have to technically go in and click an extra thing. That might be for you if you're a click reply all person. And I see this a lot in um, people coordinating details. So let's say um, something's gone out and we need to coordinate. Is everyone available for a meeting? And someone pitches an idea of the meeting time. Well, they've sent it to all 10 people on the team. And the first person who gets it hits a reply all saying, that time works for me. And then the next person sees, oh, they hit reply all. I guess I'm supposed to reply all. So then they hit reply all. That time doesn't work for me. How about this time? And next thing you know, you have 10 emails in your inbox because everybody's hitting reply all. So recognize when you're doing that, who are you answering the question to? Who actually needs the information? Does the whole team need to know that you were available for that time? Absolutely not. Only the person who called the meeting. You reply only to them. Always replying to that person, rarely replying all. Spelling and grammatical errors can completely undermine your credibility. So this I cannot emphasize enough. And if we'll talk about some tips and tricks for this in the next session. There are tips and tricks to help yourself. If there's certain words you trip up on or certain grammar issues you trip up on, there's ways that we're going to overcome that. But you need to make a note that of all the things that can undermine your credibility, this one is almost number, number one. In fact, when I'm hiring people for another workplace that I work in, uh, I, I don't even call people if their resume has spelling and grammatical errors because I figure if they didn't care enough to write properly about themselves, they may not care enough to write properly about my company. So this is huge for credibility. Not responding can be so frustrating. Now, if there's a pet peeve I have about email, it's that people want instant responses. And that's not fair, right, to expect that people are answering you within the hour or sometimes even within the day. But certainly not responding and leaving something indefinite is not only unkind, but you actually erode the trust with your team if you happen to do that. Vacation notification, it's there for a reason. Use it. If you're taking that extra day on a long weekend, use it so that when someone is emailing you on a Thursday asking you to do something before Tuesday, they'll get to see and find out, oh, they're not going to be in Friday. They've made it an extra long weekend. This is so important with catching deadlines and so on. And this is included in those email settings. So just like you can change your settings on how you reply or checking which email address you're replying from, you could go in and change your vacation or in some email programs that's called out of office notification. So make a note to figure out how does my out of office work? You should be able to know how to do that and know how to do that easily so that when it's you know the end of the day and you're like, oh, I forgot to set my out of office notification, you could quickly do that without being tempted to skip that step before you leave the building. <laughs> and the too much CCing. This is sort of like the reply all. Please do not address an email to one person and then copy people just in case. So it's not okay to copy someone when you think, well, just in case they want to know this. That's not fair because you've created action on their end. They have to open an email and they have to spend their time figuring out why it is that they got this email. So CC, just to touch on that briefly, if you remember back in the day uh, where we had carbon paper, so you'd go to the store and they would write out an invoice for you. So they'd write on a piece of paper and underneath it was a piece of carbon paper and it would transfer the ink or transfer the script to a paper below. That's where we get the carbon copying from. And if we could think just as literal as that, 
why did we have that carbon copy in the first place? The most you ever saw people get a carbon copy was a triplicate, right? So it would be the store owner would keep a copy, the customer would get a copy, and then the accounting department would get a copy. That's it. They didn't make 10 copies at a time. So think about that strategically with your teammates and your coworkers. Are you an overuser of the CC button? Are you a time sucker because you're using that CC function a little too much? Jokes are basically obsolete. This used to be a thing when email was new. It used to be office acceptable to be able to send jokes around. It's not really anymore. Just with the volume of correspondence that comes through email now, faxes aren't coming anymore. Snail mail hardly comes anymore. So with the volume of what people are dealing with in their inboxes, it's considered inappropriate in the workplace to be distributing jokes and irrelevant humorous things around by email. If I have another pet peeve, it's about subject lines. <laughs> I can't stand subject lines that don't say what the topic is. And you got to be clear and give a great subject line. That comes back to your planning and organizing, right? In that writing process. That planning and organizing of what you're doing, you should be able to give that subject line in less than one sentence. It should be a short sentence that describes what this is about, a project or a deadline or a meeting, etc. I love the next one. I work with one colleague, her name's Leah, and she is so good at this. Where I'm tempted sometimes to have a whole discussion in email, she's super vigilant about one subject per message. So her emails, I might get five emails in a row from her, but all five emails are about a different subject. And if you're a kind of person who likes to cross something off your to-do list, this is probably your most important thing to learn right here. <laughs> because if you keep your emails to one subject per message, it's easy to delete them out of your inbox when you're done because you've dealt with those particular top topics. Using abbreviations right, especially for your industry, is key. Uh, you don't use your text writing, okay? So if you're texting, it's kind of okay to say BRB, like be right back, or LOL, or instead of writing out the word you, as in Y-O-U, when you're texting, sometimes you can use the letter U instead. Not in an email, never, no matter how well you know the person, never. And we'll get to why that is, but for now, just never write in an email anything with texting shortcuts. <laughs> high priority, if you're a over flagger of urgent or high priority, people are gonna stop reading your emails and that really has to do with your own self-management. If you've timed out your projects properly, if you've given yourself margin on when you need to hear back from people, you won't need the high priority button so often because not everything's gonna be an SOS. So instead of dragging people into urgent, 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 being able to manage your own tasks and know when you need feedback and giving people that lead time of a couple days to get back to you. Self-management is so, so critical. Now, this is a fun one. It's a little bit uh, straightforward, but you know, let's, let's look at that first one. Your job is driving you crazy and you're ready to quit. Do you send an email like this or do you not send it? Give me a thumbs up if you send it and a thumbs down if you should not send it. You're talking to your best friend at work. This is driving me nuts. I got to get out of here. And yeah, like, no, you're right. You don't, you don't hit the send button on that. If you need to type it out just so you can get it off your mind, go ahead and delete it. Get it off your chest. But do not hit send even to your most trusted confidant because you have no idea how often it happens that let's say your name is John or your, you know, your best friend's name is John and you're going to email John. Well, your company has those autofill email addresses, right? So as soon as you start typing John in, it automatically pops up the John in your company. And you would be amazed how many times that wrong John fills in that field and someone sends off an email to the wrong person just because the email populated the name and then oops, if it's got something like this in there, like good golly. 
If you finished a report that your supervisor asked you to write for your whole team and you need some feedback, is that a send or not send? Is that a thumbs up or a thumbs down? Do you hit send on that? You're looking for feedback, great. That's a way to collaborate with people. Absolutely, that's when you can send. But there too, recognizing if you're looking for feedback, you only send that to the people you need the feedback from. You don't copy anyone in for information. You don't copy anyone in. You're talking about an unfinished report because you're looking for some feedback to still finalize it. So be real careful about your CCs there. The next one, I'm sure you know, this is a thumbs down, am I right? <laughs> Accounting says, oh, just email us your banking information and send that over. Never, never, never. We don't send that ever, ever, ever. In fact, double check that with your company policies. Sometimes your own company has internal policies about what you're allowed to send by email as it relates to private information and banking or accounting information. I love the next one. It's totally a yes. Absolutely, you sent. You go ahead, you've worked on a proposal. This is what email was created for. <laughs> you've got a, a proposal, a plan, a budget, dates. You want to regurgitate the conversation and say, did I get this right? Are we on track? That's an absolute yes. And I, you know, the last one, I just got to give you the answer. It's an absolute no. This is my number one pet peeve. I really can't handle this. <laughs> When someone feels urgency on their end and they send you an email at 4.30 p.m. saying, this is urgent, I need an answer on this. Well, what's to say that your coworker even checks their email at 4.30? Maybe they're really organized and they only check email at certain times of the day, which is a great practice to get into, I might add. You cannot send an SOS email at 4.30 and expect that they start their work day when you're planning on ending yours. So no, don't send that one. Pick up the phone for that one. In that whole writing process, when you're planning and organizing, and again, that's the part I hope you're doing by hand and jotting out your bullet points. And then when you're crafting the email itself and doing the writing of it, are you asking yourself these questions? What's the importance of this? And that's going to determine who it goes to, when it goes, and is email even the right tool that I should be using, depending on the importance. Do I need feedback? Is this a permanent record? What's in my tone and so on and the formality? Is there anything I need to touch on with confidentiality and workplace policies? These are part of the organizing stage. And these questions get overlooked so often that it really could undermine your credibility and trust that you have with your team if you're not asking them. When you're sending the email, it's really up to you. It's not communicated when the other person has heard from you. It's communicated when the other person gets it, when they know what it is you were trying to communicate. So the onus is not on the reader. The onus is not on the listener. The onus is on the sender. Have you been able to articulate your message? Have you sent it to the right person? And was it done in a timely manner? Now, this is in your handbook if you want to jot this out. This is a great little acronym. Um, before you speak, think. Or in our case, before you write, think. Is what you're writing true? Do you have the facts? Is what you're writing helpful? Are you adding an unnecessary email to a conversation? Or are you adding an emotion-fueled email to a conversation? Or is your email actually helpful? Is it inspiring, as in, is it motivating or demotivating to the person who gets it? And this is where some of those uh, beware tips come in, right? It's not inspiring if every email you send is marked urgent. That does not inspire someone to action. They don't take it seriously if that's the case. Is it necessary is probably my favorite question to ask because it's like, really? You had to email me about that at midnight? You couldn't just talk to me at the office about that? So is it necessary? And is it kind? So does kind cover your tone? Remember, we only have that 7% that we're working with with email, right? Where we're using actual words and we're not using tone and body language. So the K one here is so important. Is it the right tone that you intended it to be? 
And often you only know that when you step away and give it some time. That whole organizing and planning your email, it's so important to recognize this in three steps. Who the heck is your audience? What's it for? And what do you want your reader to actually do with this email? <laughs> That's a critical piece that, that cannot be overlooked. If you're talking to coworkers, or if you're talking to a subordinate, or if you're speaking to your supervisor, or if you're making a sales transaction online, knowing who that audience is will help you craft the proper language and information. So who are they? Are there demographic pieces that are different? Does it mean something different if someone's in this stage of life or that stage of life or lives in this country or that country or speaks this language or works at my company or doesn't work at my company? What are those demographics of who the people are that I'm emailing? What's their interest in it? What's their stake in it? Are they an internal stakeholder and they have a foot in, they have a risk with the company or are they external and somebody that I'm dealing with outside of my company? All the things on who initiated this and, and what's the point and what are they expecting from me? What do they need out of this? Now, I emailed someone online recently. I had purchased something at a store uh, last year. It was my daughter's most prized possession. It's just a little tiny thing, but she lost it. And so the other day I went online to see if I could order it again and it wasn't there. It wasn't in the online store. And I was like, oh, oh no. So I emailed the company and I said, I don't know if you still sell this or not, but this just meant so much to my daughter. And if there's any way you have one somewhere in a stock room, I'll pay whatever shipping it takes if I could just please buy one. And so I had to give them space. Who were they? They were a big organization with lots of moving parts and I just emailed their contact form information. So I understood that I was dealing with a big ship and I was just a little query and I was clear about my expectations. Could I buy this? Could you ship it to this address? And here's, I'm willing to pay for that. And when they responded to me, they touched on all those exact same things. So analyzing where's it going, how big of a funnel is this going into is really clear, is really key on being able to get your email in front of the right eyes. Why are you writing? Is it an information piece? Tell them that up front. I just wanted to share this information with you. That might even be effective in your subject line. Often you can use in your subject line for information only regarding XYZ project or so on. Then someone knows I don't have to take action. I can just open that email and read it whenever I want. The education and the collaboration is another purpose and why you're doing the email. Maybe you're persuading, maybe you're asking them for action. And the action piece is so important. What is it you want them to do? Well, in that planning and organizing phase before you even get to writing it, if you know this answer first, it's going to shape your entire email. And my favorite is when the action comes first. So I love when someone writes to me and says, I would like your feedback on this document. Could you get it to me by Monday? I absolutely love that. And then I go on to read the, S, the rest of the email. <laughs> so sometimes your action piece could even go at the front. And even if you don't write it that way, I encourage you in your planning and organizing, know what your action piece is. What do you need the reader to do with what you're sending? Now, writing for clarity is so important. This is a good example of non-clarity. <laughs> so this is a good example of confusion. Instead of saying, I woke up at 6.30 and then went back to sleep. Instead, we can use 50 words to say something that could have been said in 10 words. This is another example. And I'm sorry to say this is something we've all been guilty of. When we want to sound smart, we tend to overstate something. Read this email. I'll give you a second to read that. Crazy, right? It could have been so easily to say, we're going to reschedule our two o'clock meeting. <laughs> yes, thumbs down, absolutely, I agree. 
<laughs> typically, someone wants to sound smart when they do something like this, but sounding smart isn't by the big words you use or the amount of words you use. It's really by the clarity. The whole point is clarity. I'm not being overly wordy. I'm not using jargon that no one else knows what it means or cheesy cl cliches that only mean something to my little team that I'm in, but I'm using plain language. And plain language is the key to structuring your email properly. Because if you've done that planning and organizing, and then you go to write that second step, do the writing stage, if you're really committed to plain language, people will absolutely get what you're saying. And plain not only means simple, it means concise. When we do that, the benefits are outstanding. <laughs> We get to use plain language that means something to the actual audience that we're talking to. So plain language for your industry and customer service in the specific company you work for may not be so plain if you're dealing with a mechanical engineer. They use different phrases on what their clarity is. So plain language puts it in a place where your audience knows exactly what you mean. It totally frees you up from so many workplace errors and especially interpersonal misunderstandings. If you have a hundred words, you have the potential for someone to misunderstand a hundred words. If you have 10 words, your chance goes down to only 10. <laughs> and that can save you time for you and the person reading it. And it certainly bolsters your credibility. I feel like when you're designing your your emails and when you're planning them out, really plain language is like beautiful icing over a perfect cake. So you might have a great cake, it's an email that's worth sending, the content is necessary, the content is, is well mapped out, and that's just a plain old cake. But when you change the language to be clear and concise language, it's like you just ice it beautifully. And when you do that and create white space in your email, so it's not just this big, long thing. Like, have you ever read the technical, click on all the technical understanding of different websites and stuff? It's like pages and pages of gobbledygook. Giving some space in all of that for people is such a breather. Having bulleted lists, shorter paragraphs and shorter sentences is so helpful. Use color if you need to. But I love when people break down the steps. Here's my answer. Here's the question you asked. Here's my answer. Here's the question you asked. Here's my answer. And it's clear on each point, on each topic, whether that's with color or naming yourself as the one who's answering it. Um, that's another tip for you if you're dealing with more than one person in an email thread. You could see in this case when Andrea's replying, she is replying that Andrea wrote phase two of the project. So then if Joe is also going to reply, he could add his comments below. They could be organized together, but we could see which author contributed which lines. And fun fact about that, if you haven't taken Google Suite with us, do that because that workshop talks on other ways you can collaborate with people too. But best practices, Start with the subject line every single time. There used to be something that was commonly used in the office. It's not as common anymore, but um, an email could start with the letters D-N-O, meaning do not open, uh, because the subject line could say it all. So it might say D-N-O colon meeting time revised to 2.30 p.m. And that's it. There would be nothing inside the email. The person didn't even need to open it. They could just delete it right then. So if you see DNO, that's what that means, um, that everything you need is in the subject line. And it's kind of a fun experiment to do because if you could get your subject line super effective, uh, people will probably buy you coffee to thank you for that. <laughs> Understanding your audience, it's totally different. The language you use, the amount of words you use, and what you're obligated to say or not say, completely different depending who your audience is inside and outside the company. Planning it out, mapping out why it is you're doing this and what it is you need the person to respond to. 
any particular supporting information and we'll touch on that next week when we talk a little bit about attachments and so on but within the body of the email itself is there supporting information don't even send the email if you say I'll get back to you on this other thing send it all in one so that it's all there your proofreading I'm gonna give you tips and tricks next time for that um, but the proofreading and the revision is so important it's not just proofreading for typos it's proofreading for tone and messaging. And you know, one trick I want you to use this week already is to read your email out loud before you hit send. Because as soon as you read something out loud, you hear right away what the tone is and whether it's even making sense and in the right order. And something happens different to your brain when you read something silently or when you read it out loud when your ears hear your voice saying something it takes your proofreading to a whole other level and of course fonts and tone are huge so the actual font you use you know maybe you don't want the one that is called comic maybe you don't want that in the workplace and maybe um, there's some things to remember about tone in email if you're using all capital letters that means you're screaming at people if if you use regular font it it means you're not screaming at people you know um so checking on your tone and your language and and i guess one thing that's worth mentioning is i just encountered this this week um where it it's important to to remember acceptable business language too there was an email i encountered about um profanities so just the passion someone had in expressing themselves professionally they thought they could take to email and use those same colorful words <laughs> and that's not something you put in an email so you don't um, want to be using your profanities to express your point the whole point is being able to get your seven percent of communication your words to be strong words clear words and you don't do that with colorful adjectives you do that with logic and reasoning that's the best way to do it so recognizing that there's an opening component, there's an information component, and there's a closing component. So I might want to greet someone and say, dear so-and-so, or if it's a, a close colleague and we're back and forth, I might just say, hey, Joe. And then my additional information is, here's the situation, here's what we need, or here's what you were looking for. And then at the end, I'll be really clear. You don't need to reply to me on this. I wanted you to have the information for your records. Or I might say, could you get back to me by tomorrow at 2? Um, I'll give a clear ask in the end of the email. And then, of course, always signing it with whoever you are, whether that's best regards, thank you, cheers, and your name. Now, I'm going to put your skills to the test. And here's the thing, in your student handbook that you have today, <laughs> you have a bad example of an email. And I would like you to edit that and write me the good example of that email. So take a note of weminterlake at gmail.com. I think in your student handbook, it actually might direct you to a different email address. So I do want you to take a note of this from this slide where you're gonna rework Kat's email and you're gonna send it to us at weminterlake at gmail.com just rewording it. Tell us how you would do it. You could elaborate on why you did it or how it's restructured, but that's something I want you to send off to us. And then I won't show yours and make an example of you next time, but we will talk about what the right ways were that we used and we'll look at a good one together. And of course that brings us to the end of today's session. And then just looking ahead at next week, these are the ones we're really gonna cover and it'll come along with tips and tricks and some practical tools that you could take away with you. And I think you'll find those helpful, not only in your current role, but even looking ahead at what opportunities lie ahead for you. So thanks for being with us today. And that's really what we wanted to cover in session one. Excellent, Rochelle. That was amazing. Uh, you know, you continue to add value and and add more information on the workshops that you had previous. So 
Thank you so much for that, Rochelle. I'd also like to thank the participants for joining us today and also for everyone completing the JOT form that was requested during the webinar uh, to move the webinar because uh, Rochelle is using that information as she speaks. She's um, an amazing lady. Also, I have re uh, put the link in for the handout if you didn't get it. Please make sure that you download that and download it onto your computer. And we will see you in the next webinar. So thank you very much. Have a wonderful day. And thank you, Rochelle.